Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. Uh, it's official. The wife of the Israeli Prime Minister, Sarah Netanyahu, has just been indicted for alleged systematic fraud. The First Lady has been formally charged for ordering, ordering $100,000 worth of meals from gourmet chefs at the taxpayer's expense. These allegations have been circling the Prime Minister's wife for several years now, but today it's formal indictment of criminal charges filed by Israeli Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit still comes as quite a bombshell. The paperwork formally charges Sarah Netanyahu with, with both fraud and breach of trust for alleged systematic fraud of nearly $100,000 of public funds. Similar charges have also been filed against Ezra Sadoff, the former deputy director general of the prime minister's office. Sadoff is charged with working with Sarah Netanyahu to create a false front that the PM's office did not employ a private chef. Indictments specified that this was systematically done from at least 2010 until 2013. Legal reps for Sarah Netanyahu have repeatedly denied any wrongdoing and claimed that she had no awareness she may have been committing criminal offenses. Netanyahu's lawyers were said at some point to have been pursuing an outside settlement to avoid criminal charges, and rumor is that Sarah Netanyahu may have personally refused any such settlement because it would have required her to refund the funds to the state. Attorney General Mandelblit now says there will be no settlement anyway due to the fact that Sarah is also a suspect in another scandal linked to her husband, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This would be the case 4,000 investigation in which Netanyahu is suspected of granting political favors to the Bezik Telecom Company in exchange for favorable news coverage from its news website. The Prime Minister has consistently said that he's done nothing wrong. That investigation is still underway. It's been 24 hours since yesterday's massive rocket attack from Gaza, which saw at least 45 rockets fired from the Strip into Israeli territory. The IDF is bracing for even more conflict on the horizon, and army units have just boosted additional Iron Dome missile defense interceptors near the Gaza border. The flames of this crisis have been mounting ever since Palestinians in Gaza began flying flaming kites and balloons over the border, burning hundreds of acres of Israeli fields. Though these arson attacks haven't claimed any casualties, there have been many close calls. Just yesterday, a bundle of balloons carrying a hidden explosive device landed in an Israeli family's backyard on their children's trampoline. By now, Israeli residents in the south are all but accustomed to such threats. Army sappers were called out and tragedy was averted. However, speculation is high that this may all be spiraling towards an all-out war. Many believe that it's just a matter of time before first blood is spilled. If such a thing were to happen, we'd likely be seeing a new and brutal war ignite on the Gaza front. Nearly one year after threatening to withdraw from the United Nations Human Rights Council, Ambassador Nikki Haley and Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have just delivered on that promise. As of today, the United States will no longer be a part of the UNHRC, and Nikki Haley has specifically cited the Council's alleged anti-Israel bias as the primary reason why. Here's her official statement. There are several countries on the Human Rights Council who do share our values. Many of them strongly urged us to remain engaged in the Council. They are embarrassed by the obsessive mistreatment of Israel. They share our alarm with the hypocrisy of countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Democratic Republic of Congo, and others serving on the Council. Ultimately, however, many of these like-minded countries were unwilling to seriously challenge the status quo. We gave them opportunity after opportunity and many months of consultations, and yet they would not take a stand unless it was behind closed doors. Some even admittedly were fine with the blatant flaws of the Council, as long as they could pursue their own narrow agenda within the current structure. Here with more on this development is ILTV's Brett Allen Smith. Brett, 
Uh, I don't think this exactly caught people off guard, but still, it's a very significant move, no? Sure, I mean, this is something that the Trump administration has threatened to do, you know, for quite some time now. And this also follows a well-worn strategy of the Trump administration in withdrawing from past international agreements, such as, you know, the Paris Climate Accords and the JCPOA around nuclear deal. You know, I think for Trump, the presumption here is that departing from these agreements is in line with his, you know, America first policy, but at the same time, the obvious counter-argument is, if what the U.S. truly wants is a reform of these groups, how can they do that if they're no longer even a part of them? I mean, take the U.N.'s Security Council as an example. There, Nikki Haley has repeatedly used American influence to veto resolutions that they feel are, you know, biased against Israel. But as of now, they're officially not going to be able to do that anymore now that they've taken themselves out of the Human Rights Council, you know, if the treatment of Israel is really the big issue here. So that's an interesting point, and, a, and actually a common criticism, mm -hmm. though uh, I will say that Prime Minister Netanyahu has already praised America's decision to withdraw, mm -hmm. and Nikki Haley says in her statement that you know staying in the council at this time is hypocritical to its mission of serving human rights. Yeah, I mean, I will say something else about the timing here. You know, this withdrawal comes at a time when the Trump administration is facing severe criticism for its zero tolerance immigration policy, which includes separating children of migrants from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border and keeping them in bare bones holding centers all over the United States. Now, pictures and audio tapes of these facilities have already leaked out along with testimonies of doctors and senators. And in these tapes, you can literally hear children crying for their parents. And some of them can be seen being held in cages. And the press has also learned of at least three tender age centers in Southern Texas where children aged three and below are being held, again, separated from their parents who are facing prosecution for legal entry and with no end in sight here. In fact, just a few days ago, the head of the UN's Human Rights Council had this to say. In the United States, I'm deeply concerned by recently adopted policies which punish children for their parents' actions. In the past uh, six weeks, nearly 2,000 children have been forcibly separated from their parents. The American Asso Association of Pediatrics has called uh, this cruel practice government-sanctioned child abuse. Well, a as we know, President Trump has often defended this policy and accused Democratic lawmakers of having legislated it before his time. Mm. At this time, however, there doesn't appear to be an actual written law that requires this policy. It was seemingly put into action by Trump's attorney, uh, Attorney Gen General Jeff Sessions, right. just last month. And he was citing uh, Reno v. Flores, I think, but that agreement is still in litigation. Now, on a co coincidental side note, though, today also happens to be World Refugee uh, Day, correct, Brett? Yeah, it is, you're right. The Pope has actually just tweeted a message of hope in honor of World Refugee Day. In the tweet, he specifically criticizes Trump's immigration policy here, which he slammed just a few days ago as immoral. And that's a sentiment that's in line with what countless Christian leaders across the United States have said as well. So, you know, I just want to make it clear. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for joining us, and I appreciate the update. Thank you, Brett. Of course. Truly shocking developments just now from Israel's Shin Bet security agency. Gonen Segev, Israel's former minister of energy under both Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres in the 90s, has just been arrested for allegedly spying for Iran. Investigators believe that Segev was actively providing the Iranian regime with intel about Israel since 2012, and that he's even been to Iran twice for this very reason. Though most speculate that Segev probably didn't have access to any truly damaging information, this is undeniably a huge intelligence win for Iran. Segev's backstory is a long and troubling one. After his time as a politician, Segev was arrested in 2004 for trying to smuggle drugs into Israel from Amsterdam. At the time of his arrest, he told police that the pills were just M&Ms. His criminal CV only got worse over the next few years, racking up charges for credit card fraud and illegally forging his diplomatic passport with a pencil. He was sentenced to five years in prison, during which time the state revoked his medical license. Segev then moved to Nigeria, where he says he continued to practice medicine. But it's precisely at this time in 2012 when officials now believe Iranian officials recruited him as an operative for the regime. Segev allegedly maintained ties with current Knesset members in order to funnel updated intel to Iran. And he may have even connected Iranian agents with Israeli officials without their knowledge. Segev, now indicted of espionage, aiding the enemy during a time of war and providing information to the enemy, has not denied the charges. He instead claims that he was merely acting as a double agent the 
whole time. The Justice Ministry has confirmed that the death penalty could very well be on the table for this case. But regardless, this is already a story destined to go down in infamy. Two days ago, a massive round of airstrikes pummeled a region of eastern Syria along the Iraqi border. The precision attacks, which killed at least 50 Syrian fighters as well as nearly two dozen Iraqi soldiers, were quickly attributed to the United States. But now an unnamed official within the American administration has confirmed that Israel was allegedly behind the strike all along. If true, Sunday's airstrikes would represent a significant departure from past Israeli strategy in the region. Typically, the IDF targets Hezbollah or Iranian-linked forces in either southern or western Syria. These airstrikes in eastern Syria, however, appear to specifically target pro-regime Syrian factions, unaffiliated with Iranian proxies. Iraq's foreign ministry has condemned these airstrikes, which left at least 22 members of its own army dead. Iraq claims that their forces were fighting Islamic Jihad cells in the region. Others say that this particular part of Iraq's troops may have been part of an external paramilitary group funded by Iran. Prime Minister Netanyahu has consistently promised that Israel's army will act as needed in Syria to prevent an Iranian takehold. Many believe Israel has even signed a secret accord with Russia to push Iranian troops back from the border, with the long-term goal of removing Iran from the region completely. Media is rarely given access to terror sites in the Hamas-run Gaza Strip, but yesterday CNN published an incredible behind-the-scenes look at the Islamic Jihad terror group's operations both above and below the ground. Reporter Ian Lee was even blindfolded and taken to military training sites and rocket launching points throughout Gaza, as well as the inside of a tunnel used for smuggling weapons and attacking Israel. As you can see, many of these tunnels are reinforced with concrete to protect them from caving in, but also from potential airstrikes. Israel has a different name for them, terror tunnels. We use them as a shield against heavy missiles fired by F-35 and F-16 aircraft, as well as helicopters, so that our fighters can move and play their role defending the Palestinian people. These chilling images are a rare glimpse into the Islamic Jihad's organization within Gaza. Though the terror group isn't nearly as large nor as dominant as Hamas, their operations have escalated in recent months. In the report, Lee is also taken to a site that his Islamic Jihad guide tells him was used to fire rockets. When confronted about why the terror group targets Israeli civilian areas, including a recent incident where a rocket landed in an Israeli kindergarten, the man responds that the group never plans to target children, but that mistakes are sometimes made. Contrary to these words, the reporter points out what most IDF officials have always said, that terrorists continue to fire rockets indiscriminately from the Strip. This CNN report comes at a difficult crossroads for Israel when tensions with Gaza are at an all-time high and with no end in sight. All right, well, the Israeli government is advancing a new bill that would make it illegal to either film or publish footage of IDF soldiers carrying out their duties. The proposal would punish offenders with jail time for recording or promoting material that harms the soldier's spirit. The exact, the exact terms of this definition would likely be left for the courts to decide, but the Knesset's ministerial committee has just given the bill the go-ahead. That means it'll go up for a first vote later this week. This bill has elicited vocal responses on both sides of the spectrum. Israeli and military leaders have often pushed for a bill like this, accusing NGOs and human rights organizations of bias against the army. Others, however, say that the bill is a dangerous breach of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. They point to several famous cases in the past where IDF misconduct was only discovered because activists were able to film and publish it. Israeli military conduct in the occupied territories in the West Bank is an especially delicate issue. Along these lines, we've learned that President Trump's ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, has apparently rejected a long-standing rule that requires the U.S. to review the human rights records of nations that receive U.S. aid money. Friedman and apparently argued back in October that Israel should be the sole exception to this rule. Friedman's efforts to block the U.S. from even checking the IDF's human rights record was documented in an email sent to the State Department. Friedman writes, 
Israel is a democracy whose army does not engage in gross violations of human rights and has a robust system of investigation and prosecution in the rare circumstance where misconduct occurs. Despite this claim, many argue that this lack of transparency is a troubling tactic for Israel to take, considering the many accusations of human rights abuses leveled at the IDF. Regardless, if this new bill is passed, it would punish offenders with a maximum of 10 years in jail for any footage that harms state security, and five years for anything that puts the army in a negative light. In a very rare decision, rabbinical courts in Haifa have just granted an Israeli woman a retroactive bill of divorce. The woman, who remains unnamed, was for years considered a chained wife because she wasn't allowed a divorce by her husband. But thanks to secret legal proceedings, she's just been set free. And here with the full story is ILTV's Aaron Porras. Now, Aaron, what led to this decision and, you know, why were these secret proceedings? Uh, so, as you kind of mentioned just a, a moment ago, in traditional Jewish practice, uh, a woman or any spouse really cannot remarry into a Jewish wedding unless they get an official Jewish religious divorce certificate, aka the get. Right. So, when a husband, typically the husband, doesn't give the get to his to his former wife, then she cannot re remarry in the Jewish faith uh, at all. And, and that's in fact, where the chained that's the where the chained, chained wife, wife thing, you know, exactly. And and. You know, a, a woman who is chained for all intents and purposes, she's single in every other way except for that marriage certificate. And a civil divorce doesn't do anything uh, right. for this. Um, and they're also chained husbands as well. Obviously, they're few and far between. But um, Exactly. Well, you know, why did it take so long for this specific case to go through? What made it so difficult? So usually the rabbinical courts, like in a case of a, of a, chained, uh, of a chained spouse, typically the rabbinical courts will try to coerce the spouse to give the get, and that they do that anywhere from social pressures, you know, mm -hmm. to excommunication or even imprisonment. Um, but right. this husband in this case, Oded uh, Oded Guez, even after being excommunicated by the Haifa rabbinical court, and uh, I'm sorry, the Jerusalem rabbinical courts, back in 2016, he just fled the country on a forged passport. So I mean, and he still didn't give the get. Right. So yeah. I'm guessing then that's where the secret court rulings came in here, right? Yeah. Basically, the court started to think, you know, okay, if, if nothing's going to work, we have to find out another solution. And that's kind of when they started going in that direction. They, you know, they, they moved towards legal solutions saying that, quote, uh, after intense discussions during which the court heard testimony and professional opinions and evaluations, and after great effort by the court, it was decided today to nullify the marriage and to allow uh, Ms. Guez to end her status as a chained woman. So now she's officially single in the eyes of, of Jewish law, as if she had never been married before. Now, you mentioned um, that this was one of the worst chained wives incident, or even if you didn't yeah. mention it, it is. Sure. Uh, why haven't the courts used legal proceedings before, and why did this take so long? So again, there, there are a few uh, reasons that that they don't jump to legal proceedings right away. So the first uh, is because the courts are ultimately holding out that their uh, their pressures will eventually work. Mm -hmm. And there have been cases that have taken a lot longer than this. So I said, yeah, this is this is one of the longer cases of a chained uh, wife, you know, getting her divorce. But just recently, there was uh, there was a case of a woman having been chained for 23 years, and that was actually solved with legal proceedings uh, just two weeks before this one. And so that was another another reason. A lot of people are saying, you know, maybe there just wasn't the legal precedent that was set. Um, and, and also, they don't want to advocate for people to go through the court system or the mm -hmm. rabbinical courts through the legal system instead of getting the get. They want people to kind of stick to the traditions as much as possible. So even the, even the legal proceedings, the process and mechanism through which they actually made this possible without the get, mm -hmm. they're not revealing how they did that. Well, you know, this is obviously um, a happy moment for sure. women across Israel who, you know, this, this yeah. woman being afforded, um, you know, the ability to, to, to yeah, no longer absolutely. be chained is a big deal. And, you know, there are many young couples who are now reconsidering whether or not they want to get married in uh, the Rebbe here because they yeah. fear um, that they'll end up in a situation like this. Obviously, nobody wants to go into marriage thinking sure. about divorce, but the reality of the matter is when you hear about cases like this, it's a bit scary. Aaron, thank well, you so much for yeah. joining us. Thank you. All right, if you're like me at all, then you're probably addicted to good documentaries. And ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with the top five Israeli docs just begging for your home theater. For its tiny size, Israel is one of the most talked about countries in the world. Whether good news or bad, the Holy Land somehow makes its way into a headline or two. That's why I'm here to give you guys the top five Israeli documentaries that'll give you a deeper look into life in Israel. 
First up is the documentary The Green Prince. Mossab Yosef's father was one of the founders of the terrorist organization Hamas. The movie shows how he became an informant for Israel's internal security agency, the Shin Bet. In the documentary, compromising interviews between Yosef and his Israeli handler are shown and portrays the life of the spy. This is not your typical story and is one that will keep you on the edge of your seat till the very last second. Second on our list is the 2012 documentary, Numbered. In the Auschwitz death camp, inmates were dehumanized and given numbers instead of names which were permanently tattooed on their arms. Numbered provides an intimate account of how Auschwitz survivors relate to their numbers now and how they've had an impact on their lives. Endless Tears is an absolute understatement with this one. This third documentary will give you the chills without a doubt. The flat focuses on the grandson of a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. When he's clearing out his grandmother's Tel Aviv flat after her death, he discovers that she had been friends with a high-ranking Nazi official. The movie follows as he's determined to find answers and travels to Germany to meet the Nazi's daughter. You won't regret watching this movie documentary that takes you on his personal journey of uncovering his family's past. Fourth up is the 2014 Dancing in Jaffa. The documentary is focused around peace and coexistence. It follows ballroom dancer Pierre Dulane's Dancing Classrooms program in Jaffa, Israel, an area with mixed Arab and Jewish Israeli population. It focuses on three children from different backgrounds and shows the deep-rooted issues that exist in Israel, but most importantly, the power of the arts in bringing people together. So heartwarming and absolutely unforgettable. The Gatekeeper is fifth on our list, but of course, not any less outstanding. This Oscar-nominated documentary is based on interviews with six former leaders of Israel's highly secretive counterterrorism intelligence agency, the Shin Bet. This was the first time they agreed to be interviewed and provides a thought-provoking account of Israel's security situation since the 1967 war, from Palestinian suicide bombings to the assassination of Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin. There's not much to say other than you're missing out if you haven't seen this already. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.